We'll start, of course, in the, with a prayer of thanksgiving for bringing us here. I want you to pray from the sign of the cross with the rest of us. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for this beautiful day that you've given us. We thank you for this beautiful evening. We ask you to send your spirit upon us as we seek to grow in the knowledge of you, and especially in the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ, who has revealed you to us. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit on us to enliven our hearts and our minds as we grow in knowledge. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. All right. As I said last week, tonight is one of my favorite talks as a convert myself. Uh, one of the very, like I, like I said last week, last week's topic and the week before, these first several weeks are very foundational topics, of course, you know, such as scripture and tradition, you know, the content of our faith. Uh, last week was divine revelation, which, you know, is the mode by which we have received our faith. And this week is being the church is going to be kind of like the, that which uh, distributes our faith. And the next week we'll be talking about who is Jesus Christ, so more of more of the content of faith, or kind of the source of our faith, another form, another form of the source. And then the week after that we'll you know, continue on with various, very you know essentially Catholic concepts, but really, if you want to get right down to it, very Christian. So, and we'll talk about that later on, kind of when we get into the nature of the church and the nature of the Catholic faith slash Christian faith. So tonight's topic, we're going to start kind of a little bit back before the church, even though it's predominantly about the church. We want to start with, you know, kind of like I said last week, the, uh, you know, or like I said previous weeks, that the seed of Israel, Israel was like the seed of our faith. And when Christ came, you know, that seed was able to finally flower into the church. So we want to drop back a little bit, talk about, you know, kind of dig into the covenants a little bit more specifically that we covered last week, some of the covenants, and then progress from there. <clears throat> so, so, kind of focusing in on these covenants, you know, th those are those real decisive uh, relationships that God established with humanity, as we spoke of last year, so last week. So, every covenant, of course, has its patriarch or its mediator. So the covenants of the Old Testament, as we kind of will just briefly touch upon again here, were Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and Jesus Christ. And then with, with every covenant came a special sign. So of course it was the Sabbath, the rainbow, circumcision, the law for Moses, the throne with King David, and then the Eucharist, as we'll see that fulfillment of the signs. And then finally, you know, we talked about that covenant increase. So those are the different kind of aspects to kind of help get, you know, that, we saw that chart last week with that progression. <clears throat> so a little bit of details on the, the how these covenants are all these, uh, yeah, these covenant promises work together. We have the Sabbath, uh, which kind of represents our rest in God. So with these, like remember as I said last week, with every covenant came a blessing if, you know, you were faithful to the covenant, if, the, if that group or tribe or what have you was faithful to the covenant. Yet if they broke the covenant, there would be that curse, which, you know, the curse, the, of course, the initial curse was death, but then, you know, the curse, you know, like, for example, if you read throughout the, the Old Testament, you know, the Jews were always incurring the curse, you know, God would just cut them off. You know, that, that curse is basic separation, because they're, you know, being unfaithful, and so basically they're cutting themselves off. So it's that separation, but yet the promises are rest, peace, uh, assignment from God. So like the, the, uh, the mark of circumcision for Abraham's people. Uh, the law, you know, representing the truth of God, or the truth of the Lord, and then the throne, the reign of the Lord, which all culminate in the, the fulfillment of the Eucharist as that presence of the Lord. So that's another really uh, substantial way to understand the Eucharist is appreciating as that fulfillment, you know, being all these promises of, you know, the, the, the Jews were always expecting the promised one, the coming Messiah. Well, he came, of course, in, as we believe in the form of Jesus Christ, you know, the Word made flesh, but then he also extended himself, his presence in the church through the Eucharist as the, uh, the, uh, the real presence, which we'll get into in a couple weeks. So, and another 
some I didn't put here, but a, a, a good, if you uh, do a word search in your uh, Old Testaments, uh, another pr a prophetic uh, Old Testament sign, remember uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, typology. You, know, you had your Old Testament types, which were prophecies of Jesus, but there was also other prophecy or typology that related to things that related to Jesus, such as there was in the Old Testament, the Jews were to keep what they called the bread of presence. It was the bread, it was 12 loaves of bread that represented the presence of God with those of the 12 tribes of Israel, for example. So the bread of presence represented God always being with his people. And of course that having its own, like uh, I, don't, I don't remember if I made this point, but in uh, typo biblical typology, you have your Old Testament types, your signs, your prophecies, but they're, uh, they're you know, foreshadows or they're symbols that re represent something that's greater, so a re greater real fulfillment coming. So, of course, you have all these, <coughs> these representations of the Messiah, all these, like, you know, like Jesus said of the, you know, when uh, Abraham held up the, the staff with the serpent on it, that represented himself as that cursed thing that's going to take on the sins of the people. Now, those kind of symbols... Well, the same thing with the Eucharist. There's Old Testament symbols such as the manna in the desert, the the bread of presence. So these are Old Testament signs, you know, symbols that represent the greater coming reality. So when Christ came, he was a human person. He was that greater reality. He was the actual presence of God among his people. You know, Emmanuel, God with us. So the same thing with the Eucharist. It's that greater presence. It's not, you know, as people lost faith, you know, several hundred years ago, in the pre they lost faith in what the Eucharist was. They just started calling it a symbol again. That kind of really, you know, uh, kind of a slap in the face of what it's, you know, of the understanding of those pro prophetic, you know, symbols and their greater fulfillment, their greater that presence of God being fulfilled in them. <clears throat> so I kind of go through here and just, you know, uh, lay out, you know, how these, all these presence, these forms of God's presence, whether, you know, rest, peace, all uh, are fulfilled in Christ. Okay, so back to the covenant with Israel. The covenant with Israel is spoken, okay, is spoken of in the Old Testament as a marriage. So as I kind of alluded to before, you know, when, you know, the people would uh, fail at you know, living up to their covenant, you know, they were cutting themselves off. You know, they were basically, uh, in, in one form or another, they were uh, rejecting the first commandment, which God said, you have no other gods before me. You know, they were going after the pagan gods. So, so you know, God revealed himself to them. And so for them to after, thereafter to reject him and to go after another god was seen as a form of harlotry or adultery. So, you know, so uh, their, their sin was over often referred to as harlotry or adultery. While the, while, you know, the purpose of the God's covenants with the nation of Israel was to be, at, like uh, the Old Testament says, a light to the nations. <clears throat> so God's presence, of course, is to supposed as a light. You know, it's supposed to like, like let moths to the flame, as they say. You know? It's supposed to attract the other nations especially, you know, when the nations would come into conflict with Israel, and as we read the, many of the stories, you know, God would just, you know, have, just, you know they're considering their, uh, considering their, you know, neighboring countries, they were relatively small and relatively weak. So, you know, they, these uh, outside nations would be like, we can take these people, of course, you know, and then for, uh, in whatever, you know, miraculous way, they would, you know, Israel would conquer, unless, of course, Israel was in a time of, Adultery. So then, you know, God would say, you know, you cut yourself off from me. I'm not with you. You know, my presence, my power is not with you. So then they would all of a sudden, you know, get van vanquished, you know, by the Babylonian exile is, you know, the greatest example. <clears throat> yes. yes. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate it. So then the covenant with the church is the, is the fulfillment of all those promises with the presence of Christ. So... So in the New Testament, you know, we also have those references, as we'll get into big time in a minute here, that the church is also married to Christ. You know, uh, St. Paul refers in Ephesians, you know, he says, when he's talking about the relationship of husbands and wives, says, kind of at the end, he's like, well, this is a great mystery, and, I, and I, by, by it I refer to the relationship between Christ and the church. And then he goes very, into very explicit details, as many of you may know, especially in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in his analogy of you know, the relationship of the church to him as his bride and as his body, you know, in that kind of one flesh union, the, the, the two becoming one flesh. <clears throat> so, you know, that's, of 
course, are understood in that marital union is understood in our relationship with the Eucharist. <clears throat> and so, of course, the church is now called, you know, in Jesus' preaching and sermons, he called the church to, you know, the disciples to be lights, a light to the world. Whereby, you know, in the, like I, as I spoke of last week, in, in the end of Matthew's gospel, you know, then they're, they're, they're supposed to go, go there forth and, you know, proclaim to all nations, attracting kind of in the same respect that Israel was supposed to do. Now that uh, the church is commissioned to make disciples of all nations. So here's uh, the breakdown of the main points that we're going to go through with the, for the large part of the evening. The relationship of Christ to the church as the body of Christ, you know, one of St. Paul's you know, famous analogies or sim uh, ways of speaking of the, the relationship. And the church as the bride of Christ, which is more of a St. John. The Apostle John speaks of that. Uh, especially in the book of Revelations, and the relationship of the church to the world, that there's that kind of a difference, where, the, where to the world the church is the new creation, and then to the world the church is also Holy Mother Church. So the church is not only Holy Mother Church to us, because you know, we're you know, within the world, but the church is also a, a mother to all those in every succeeding generations, like yourselves, for example, myself, 10 years ago, you know, the church was very much nurturing, you know, trying to teach me, and so then, of course, I embraced my mother through, you know, the teachings of the Christian faith, the teachings of the church. <clears throat> so the church has the body of Christ. Now we'll dig in a little here. A good old famous uh, verse. That, now this is, you know, we say, you know, Saint Paul was well known for his, you know, his analogy of the church as the body of Christ. But you can, you might, you might wonder, well, how did how did he come up with that? Because you know. You know, you don't just, you can't just invent these ideas, these real deep theological ideas on your own, you know, unless you're a real innovator. So a real way, a good way to appreciate is through his own conversion. As I stated before, you know, a, a large part of my own appreciation of these different aspects of the faith, faith was through my own conversion, through my own process of learning. Well, St. Paul, the same way, you know, we, we learn through experience, of course. So his very, his very first encounter was on the road, the road to Damascus, his experience, where, I'll, I'll read it here, it says, As St. Paul was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the earth ground, and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said to you, and he, Paul said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, if you remember the larger context of that story, he was not necessarily persecuting Jesus himself, because at that point, Jesus had already ascended back to heaven several years, but he was on his, road, on his way to persecute the Christians. So here we, we begin to see how you know, not only Jesus is speaking of himself as intimately united to those who believe in him, and elsewhere, we, and then we can start to appreciate that when we you know, read his teachings throughout the Gospels, you know, how he says, what you've done to the least of the, these, you've done to me. You know, he's, he is very much intimately associating himself himself with his people and then as we come to appreciate you know the Christian communities you know and their the the teaching of the Eucharist we will you know better kind of come to a greater uh, fuller understanding of how that works but so this is kind of just the, the beginnings of it <clears throat> so the church is the body of Christ so trying to understand how kind of get into that marital theology the Son of God was made incarnate by the Holy Spirit. He was baptized. Uh, he, uh, the, uh, he breathed the Holy Spirit to the apostles after uh, their empowerment of Pentecost, and he instituted the Eucharist. So these are those sacraments, basically. What I'm getting, the point is getting to is these are sacraments of initiation that we all go through, that the Christians have gone through uh, for 2,000 years. They're the, you know, those initial sacraments which really unite us. You know, thereafter we have sacraments of vocation, you know, priesthood, or religious life and marriage, or the sacraments of uh, healing, uh, reconciliation, and anointing of the sick. So it's these first initial sacraments, you know, in the early church, they were very much uh, united all at the same time very often because most people like us, you know, came into the church as adults, you know, and then uh, babies were, you know, given baptism and usually, uh, Confirmation because the two sacraments are understood as together in the Eastern Orthodox Church. We'll talk about this later on the, on the sacraments uh, individually that how they were, they're still 
given together, even to babies, uh, and possibly Eucharist, uh, I'm not sure, but. <clears throat> so anyways, so, uh, so now as Christ became incarnate and then poured his spirit into these uh, sacraments, in the same way, uh, the Holy Spirit now uses these sacraments for our sake and to conform us into union with Christ through baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist. <clears throat> so here's kind of like the real highlights of for, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, where St. Paul goes into explaining that union of Christians to the, uh, to the church, to our Lord Jesus. He says, So we who are many are one body in Christ. As a body is one, though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many are one body, so also Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons, and we are all given to drink of the same of the one spirit. There may be no division in the body, but that the parts have the same concern for one another. If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts share its joy. Now you are Christ's body and individually parts of it. <laughs> so the church now, the next uh, step now, coming to appreciate, okay, now we can kind of appreciate how the church is the body of Christ, especially when we you know, take into consideration the Eucharist as you know, Christ coming into us. <clears throat> Uh, the, the two have become one flesh as the Old Testament speaks of as man and wife and uh, one of my favorite teachers uh, Scott Hahn, he likes to say uh, when he speaks of the, the marriage covenant he says the two becomes in, in uh, their image of the Holy Trinity he says the two become so one sometimes uh, nine months later you have to give it a name so kind of appreciating that you know, that, that real, real substantial bond of unity that rule that takes place, you know, our children are almost like, you know, a adjoining of us, you know, our DNA as we know in modern science. You know, they become, they're, you know, half of their, half of their mother, half of their father, but yet they're one. <clears throat> so the Eucharist or the Mass was often spoken of in nuptial terms by the ancient Christians as a marriage supper, which is like, there's a, rev a revelation uh, cites that, and a love feast, which is basically saying the same thing in different words by Ignatius of Antioch. I believe we might have spoken of last week. This was in recognition of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and our becoming one with him by receiving him just as a wife receives her husband. The church is the bride of Christ. Okay, so the next step, is, uh, the church as the new creation. Now this is where we start talking about the church in its relationship to the world and still in relationship to us as we become one with the church. The uh, creation is restored in the resurrection of Christ. Due to the breaking of the co creation covenant and the fall of man, death entered the human experience by Adam and Eve's separation from the tree of life. I remember last week during uh, questions or discussions, we talked about the, how the tree of life is a prefigurement of the cross. Now with his church, Christ is working to reconcile all things to himself. He's working to you know, kind of undo the fall. Whereby we are being, uh, by his grace, we are being transformed as the new creation. And then a couple of citations, that's another one of Paul, St. Paul's favorite analogies, the body of Christ and the new creation. To be raised up with Christ in the, at the resurrection on the last day. Another nice picture. One of the nice pictures. This is a picture of the resurrection. It was supposed to be the resurrection on the last day when he's pulling people out of their caskets. The church as Holy Mother Church. The Holy Bride becomes a Holy Mother. As Jesus Christ taught his followers, who become one body with him and his bride, Christ continues to teach all nations through his body, the church, as he is the head of the church. Thus we also speak of the church as Holy Mother Church, who, like a mother, teaches every new generation, as I said a minute ago. Another picture. Kind of, I pick this picture because it kind of gives you that visible uh, imagery of all these people kind of meshed together where they're so close you can't really distinguish you know it's just kind of a, a body you know, as we say a body of the people where is that picture this is in St. Peter's Basilica so I, as, I, as I intentionally of course chose this picture you know we have 
you have the cross, you know, the, that, that symbol, obviously, of the faith and being in one of the largest you know, Christian gathering spaces in the world. And, as a matter of fact, a side note, hopefully, if, if all goes well, God willing, I'll be there next year. So for our master's class. <clears throat> so now we're going to another uh, focus, is the, are the three stages of the church. So as we, here on earth, we're, we are referred to as the church militant, and then after we die, you know, you know, granting, of course, that most of us, you know, of course I can only speak for myself, and I'm pretty sure that I won't be perfect, you know, by the time I die, we'll be uh, entering to the, that stage of final pur purification, what we refer to as purgatory, uh, the church suffering, and then, the, of course, you know, uh, n you never want to really uh, view the church suffering or the church, or the purgatory as distinct. A lot of people make that error, especially non-Catholics, you know, who are saying, well, what does this Catholics believe about purgatory? You know, but it's it's re it's really best understood in union with heaven because it's a, a good way of explaining is maybe like the the uh, entrance room to heaven. It's that place where you wipe your wipe your feet off on the rug before you go into the house. It's that uh, it's that first stage of heaven where you're maybe feeling that first experience of being you know ushered into heaven, where that those last remnants. You know, of course, of course, considering the fact that you know. It presupposes that we've already been living that life, and we'll talk about this later in a future talk on the last things. But it's presupposing that we've, you know, started began already begun that life of faith, and we've already worked at that process. You know, it's for to be appreciate that, you know, we've already at the, in this stage uh, working to cleanse ourselves for that final cleansing or final purification. And then, of course, the church triumphant in paradise or heaven. Here's a picture I have, uh, found of the church militant on earth. You see, of course, you got your, uh, the members of the church over here. And then this, I assume, is supposed to be you know, Satan devouring souls. So you got, so you, you kind of got that dual experience on earth. You got the experience of the church where, you know, these people are being tested and tempted as well. You know, so, but you got your saints praying here. They're, you know, trying to be faithful. And you, got, you got a lot of people, unfortunately, sadly, who are just being devoured by the world, you know, by that, those demonic forces. In the background, and I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but... <laughs> and then this is a good image of the church suffering. A lot of, uh, there's a, a, a verse in, from St. Paul where he speaks of that kind of, that final trial that we go to, go through. And when you're trying to give, like, biblical support for certain doctrines, you know, most, every Catholic doctrine has a root in Scripture somewhere. Whether it's purgatory, you know, St. Paul refers to that final, pur that final testing, that purging with fire. And so from, you know, Christians have always understood that purification. You know, they were, you know, very much, you know, outdoors kind of people who did a lot of refining, you know, a lot of different, you know, refining of gold. You know, it takes, you know, I'm only speaking from what I've heard, but, you know, it takes uh, fire to, like, uh, burn out the impurities and whatnot. So, so they, they kind of envisioned the same thing, you know, as... That kind of that analogy of you know that the fire of purification that will purify us. Uh, Saint John the Baptist speaks of, also of Jesus as the one who will uh, baptize you with fire and the Spirit. <clears throat> and here is an image of the church triumphant, which is actually the top of this image. I just cropped it down. And so here's the, the, so it was an image of the people above, you know, the, the church above as the church triumphant. Wherein you know purgatory would technically be a part of, and the church uh, militant on the bottom, waiting to go up top. And then the next aspect I like to focus on is the four marks of the church. Now these are very important as well in really trying to get a historical grasp on the church, especially for our respect. You know, a lot of us are you know coming from Protestant backgrounds. It really helps to understand. The nature of the church, it's or characteristics or marks, the four marks of the church that really distinctify what the church is, so that people throughout every generation can narrow in on that. The one church, this is the original church. You know, as I've spoken of before, you know, I like to reference. I like to speak of the church because you know, coming from a multi-Protestant background, you know, some dad and his father and a Lutheran mother, you know, I like to focus in on you know, you got these various churches, you know, denominations more accurately, and then you got the the church. And so, it's it, it's good to be able to be able to know how to focus in on you know that original church. 
So the four marks are one holy Catholic and apostolic, as many of you may have heard, you know, the, the uh, Nicene Creed. <clears throat> so the first mark, the, uh, the church is one. The church is one. Uh, Christ died for one species of, of his creation, humanity, to redeem them. Since there is one Savior as our one, me uh, as our one means of salvation, there is one redemption, one salvation. Christ gave his apostles and church one revelation of God, and there is one mora uh, morality. We're not relativistic. So all these, these odd concepts of this unity, this oneness that we all share across culturally, by which we believe in God and conduct ourselves with one another, you know, our conduct in that one body, our, kind of our corporate morality, our corporate belief system. Thus Christ and the apostles have called us into a single communion with God through Christ and with one another as the church. So here's a, a passage from scripture to really illustrate that oneness that even our Lord expected of the church. Now this is a very intimate speak. This also, you know, you can see how this also very much relates to the teaching of the church as the body of Christ, you know, as that theology, as you kind of take all these verses into consideration. <clears throat> Jesus this is referred to as Jesus' high priestly prayer. In John 7, he says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, he's referring to the apostles, but for those who believe in me through their word. Now see, he, you know, kind of understanding you know, that he's commissioning them to go out. Also those who believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, even as you, Father, this is prayer number, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I give to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect, perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you have loved me. So now, there's, you can, you know, give a whole lesson on just this passage. One point I'd like to draw out is, he's very much, you know, speaking... Now, if we have any, you know, kind of grasp of Trinitarian theology, you know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we know that they're supposed to be understood as one. You know, they're three persons in one God. You know, different, uh, you know, I don't want to, this is very, very delicate talk. You don't want to slip off in the heresy or whatever by saying the wrong words, but uh, it's, it's, you know, God's presence or God's, you know, they're, they're distinct persons, but, you know, different I don't want to use the word, I'm tempted to use the word manifestation, but they're not that either because you know, God, the Father, does not manifest himself. But just trying to, and then the Father will definitely talk about this next week when we talk about who is Jesus Christ. But, but anyways, just about to get to my point being that, that very intimate union between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's talking about us, and so then he says that they be, uh, so the, and then another point I highlighted here to draw out on is that the world may, I mean, that the world may believe that you sent me. So, this is where also uh, speaking, like as I said, historically and focusing on these marks, you know, when we look at for one, so when he says the church is to be one, you know, and as we said last, as I said last week, you know, Jesus formed one church and he does, you know, he's not a polygamist, he doesn't have many churches, he formed his, he said to Peter, you are rocking on this rock, I will build my church. So we're looking for that one church you know, throughout history and, you know, when we study history, as I was very shocked when I was, you know, 21 years old. I started my investigation of, you know, comparing the different denominations. You know, most denominations stop, you know, no more than 475 years ago. And then, but then the church goes all the way back to the beginning. So, you know, history is very striking when you study the, you know, you're looking at the oneness of the church. And we'll get into that in your diagram. If you, if you guys grab your handouts, we'll get into that. And so, but uh, the next, another point I wanted to make, though. So, so just think of you know, how, how very often people are so confused now, you know. I, I you know, have family members myself now who, who no longer go to church because they're just so disenfranchised by all the divisions, you know. There's, you know, the, the sentiment is, you know, well, you know, if they can't agree amongst themselves, how am I supposed to know, you know. I'm no theologian, you know, I don't know, you know, this from that, you know. Then very often, you know, they recognize that these, you know, are these different uh, divisions are squabbling over various interpretations of the New Testament. So, you know, it's... It's very disenfranchising to be able to, very disheartening for us, you know, who you know, do actually take the time to study church history and find that one church. But, you know, if you don't ever take that time, it's very easy to become, you know, disheartened and just say, you know, screw it all, you know. But 
<clears throat> so it's, you know, but, but yeah, so, so my point getting back to, my point being it's, it's very nice when you do actually delve into it and you study church history and you see that before the Reformation there was predominantly one church. You know, there was various schisms very often, but very often they, you know, healed themselves or they kind of fizzled out because, they fizzled out because people recognized the church. And because, you know, very often the church, you know, in her missionary activity would bring the people back to her. The, the church would bring, you know, you know, people, the lost sheep back to herself. <clears throat> Another, now this, that was Jesus, now this is St. Paul. <clears throat> Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the, through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you are called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father through all and all. So you can see he's very much obviously trying to make an emphasis. He's trying to make a point. And there's a unity amongst us, you know. And even though he's speaking to the of the Ephesian Christians, he's very much making a principal point. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit. So this is, you know, even though he's speaking to one Christian community, this is a general, a general theological principle for the whole church, you know. So here is, this is your, basically, your hand up. This took me a lot of work to make this, so I hope you appreciate it. A lot of research. And this is, you know, kind of the fruit of a lot of my own research and, you know, comparative study of church history and all these different groups. Of course, this does not represent all Protestant groups because there are thousands of them, especially the, like I said before, the, the newest phenomenon, uh, non-denominational or evangelical Protestantism. It's still, you know, uh, still strikingly Protestant because it holds typically to the two main doctrines of Protestantism, which distinguish Protestantism, which is, you know, the <coughs> scripture alone, theory and the faith alone idea. So they're, you know, inherently Protestant, even though they want to call themselves non-denominational, they want to call themselves evangelical, it's, they're inherently Protestant because of their doctrine and because of their heritage, you know, from who, whom they, you know, their predecessors or their, you know, their heritage of uh, <coughs> denominational heritage. So uh, one of the points here that I really don't get into in the other part, but just for a little side note is, uh, when the, when the apostles did go out and start preaching to all nations, you know, you have, you know, as we all know, you know, the, there's the church in Ephesus, the church in Corinth, but there, was, there were uh, real major churches that became known as apostolic sees where bishops were, uh, were set up, like Antioch, uh, Jerusalem being the first, you know, the home church, uh, Rome eventually where Peter and Paul were martyred, uh, Alexandria in North Africa, these are all were the original main four, what they call apostolic sees or patriarchates. They're those, they're the, the, uh, the, the seats where St. Peter, especially, as that chief apostle, they were recognized as having a unique authority because St. Peter himself was involved in ordaining and or you know, uh, theologically training these bishops to take over the lead of the apostles as they were you know, dying off, sadly. So, so historically, especially over the first several hundred years, when there was debate in the church, the Christians, the, you know, the Christians would first naturally look to their bishop. Then, if there was still some conflict among the bishops, then the, then the local bishops would look to one of these apostolic sees, you know, that had the greater, a, a greater teaching authority. And then, if there was even still some controversy there, which very often by that time would result in a huge church council. You know, they would turn to Rome for its final authority. <clears throat> and the, the four major uh, branches, as you see on your handouts, are Lutheranism, which is the first, broke away 475 years ago. The Anabaptist, which is kind of more of a, kind of a looser, uh, a looser connection, a looser theology, because there was no real, you know, uh, manualist kind of, you know, like Luther gave his small catechism, John Calvin, which is another one of the large, he gave his, uh, the Institutes of the Christian Religion, his great thesis, which, you know, his, uh, the Reformed tradition follows after, and then the Anglican Church have their own Book of Common Prayer, Book of, you know, what have you. But, so my, my parental denominations are in there somewhere, some Adventism, Lutheranism, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, Salvation Army, Evangelical Movement, it broke off of the English church. 
And of course, if you're curious about any other particular particular ones, you can always look them up, do a little research. They all lead back to one of them. So the next mark of the church is that, that the church is holy. Okay, uh, some points to be made. Christ died for the sins of humanity so that we might be made free from sin and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's, it's very often, this is one of those marks that people kind of scoff at because, you know, because very sadly Christians don't live up or Catholics don't live up to their high calling of holiness, but we are all called to be holy. And that was one of the great emphases of the Second Vatican Council, like, you know, 40 some odd years ago was the call to holiness, you know, the priesthood. You know, a lot of us have this reverence for the priesthood because these men are, you know, you know celibate men, you know, kind of off to themselves, you know, they, you have all these kind of stereotypes. But we usually kind of give them a, a special uh, envisionment of holiness. But, you know, the, the fact of the matter is obviously that we're all called to that, you know, as the body of Christ, as, you know, the bride of Christ, so that we may be ourselves effective in drawing others to Christ as well. You know, nobody's going to be interested in Christ, like he said, be in that bond of love and unity that the Father son, and the Son have, you know, so that others, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them just as I love them. You know, so it's that that attractiveness of obviously the the life of love. Christ gave the another point is that Christ gave the seven sacraments of this of his new covenant. Then recall last week's talk a little bit on the sacraments to cleanse and empower us with the grace of His Spirit to become free. So of course, you know, there are we have that call to be become holy, and then we have that those means those sources of grace to be made holy. If of course, we avail ourselves of them. And then, the, thus the church is holy as it is animated by the Holy Spirit, and it provides the means of grace for those to receive the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> A little uh, quote from Hebrews regarding this. The one who makes people holy, he's referring to God, of course. The one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the, of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every Old Testament priest stand, stands now. Remember at this time when he's writing that there was, you know, the temple was still there and still sacrifices being made. They stand and perform his, his religious duties. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this high priest, Christ, had offered him, offered for all time, the one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So, you know, of course, there's also references there, of course, to the sacrifice of Christ, as I spoke of last week, that union, that, that intimate union we're all supposed to recognize of the Eucharist given the night before uh, Jesus' passion as the kind of the initiation of his passion. And then from there he goes into the garden for us. So that whole period of time is uh, united for our sake. So the sacrifice of the Eucharist and the sacrifice of the cross, and this is, though broken for many, one of the uh, phrases of St. Paul, though broken for many, the Eucharist has been understood since the beginning as united to the sacrifice of the cross. And then a, a little reference of Paul making that point. He says, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation, very strong word, participation in the blood of Christ, and is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Now this, of course, keeping in context what I said before about uh, where St. Paul was going on in uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Now, you, now you want, we want to appreciate that this came two chapters before where he starts talking about the, the Lord's Supper or the, the, you know, the Eucharist as we now call it. He says the cup of thanksgiving. Well, that's a translation from the Greek, from his Greek. The word thanksgiving in Greek is eucharistia or eucharist. So he says the cup of eucharist. <clears throat> the cup of eucharist, a thank, uh, which we give thank a participation in the blood. So we're, there's that connect, connectivity where he's talking about the eucharist given the night before as connected to the cross the next day, afternoon. The bread, of, the bread that we break, a participation in the body of Christ. So he's talking about, you know, the Eucharist there as the, the bread and wine as you know, being made one with the cross for us, 
for we all share in one loaf. So, of course, you know, again, he's giving a theological principle here. You know, we got to understand that in 1 Corinthians, he's talking to another, again, a particular uh, congregation, and he's also talking to them, uh, understanding a particular day. So when they're reading this, you know, they're saying, okay, we broke the bread yesterday, we broke the bread, what are you talking about, you know, one loaf. You know, we've broken several loaves, but, but the point, again, is that that theological principle that there's really one loaf because it's all connected. As Hebrew says, it's all connected, that one time for one time sacrifice. So very often, Catholics will be accused of re-sacrificing Christ, which is a clear, clearly shows a misunderstanding of Catholic teaching on the Eucharist. You know, if we, though we say it's you know the real presence of Christ, or we speak of it as the body and blood of Christ, we're not saying that we're re-sacrificing Christ. We're saying that it's actually you know throughout all time, you know, that once for all, just like Hebrew says, you know, they'll quote, they'll try to throw Hebrews back at us saying, well, Christ was sacrificed once for all. Well, yeah, Amen. You know, and this, our, the Eucharist is connected to that one time sacrifice. So even though St. Paul is talking to these Corinthians on this one day, you know, they've had several Eucharists, you know, several days before the day they're reading this. You know, he's making that uh, illusion that it's all one, it's that unity. <clears throat> so again, I like to throw out these little phrases to kind of help us remember these real important theological points. That it's the body of Christ in the Eucharist which makes us the body of Christ as the church. And so that's kind of that connection that St. Paul, you know, he, first he speaks in 1 Corinthians 10 of the Eucharist as the body of Christ. And then all of a sudden he's speaking in 1 Corinthians 12 of the church as the body of Christ. So you actually go, well, which is it? Well, very often we have these, this uh, poor tendency to make what they call, you know, dichotomies, false dichotomies, false divisions. But really, you know, they're supposed to be understood as united, so... So he's talking about the Eucharist, and he builds that up into his talk on the church, as you know, the, the, as the Spirit transforms this matter into the Eucharist. So also, the Spirit transforms us as he, the, the Eucharist enters us. You know, we're being transformed as well as we absorb Christ, absorb Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Father as well. The, the, the uh, Trinity being one is we're supposed to understand that the whole of the Trinity is present with the Eucharist, but we call it the Body of Christ. <clears throat> So we are being transformed by the Spirit as well. The church is holy, the communion of saints. I'm sure everybody knows of a great saint. So the, the next mark of the church is that the church is Catholic. Now this is very confusing to a lot of people. Where it's like, you know, where do you get this term Catholic? And so we'll discuss it. And there's also a handout. If you guys didn't grab the handout, it's correct. I'm sorry if I didn't note that at the beginning. It was it was collated, so there's it's supposed to be two sheets. But uh a little a nice article that we'll talk about in a second here. So the church is Catholic. So, uh, so the, the point on this is that since Christ died for one human race, he gave his apostles and the church one ordinary means, and he gave them one revelation of God. He calls them, and he calls them to the one morality. The church is thus Catholic, or what the term means, you know, the, the, term, the term Catholic comes from a Greek word, mean, a two-part two Greek word mean kata, Holos, uh, meaning uh, con literally concerning the whole, or what we now just say in you know, modern terms, universal. So the point being, it's concerning the whole church, or concerning you know the universal church, kind of in that Pauline understanding of the church as one, you know, the whole church throughout the world. <clears throat> so the church is thus uh, to be appreciated or understood as Catholic or universal, which is basically just an adjective. You know, one of those, like I said, one of those marks one of those characteristics. Uh, the term Catholic was uh, intentionally added to the name of the church to distinguish the church from other groups who did not teach that those universal doctrines of the apostles, and we'll get into this in a second here. The part of that union, you know, as Paul, St. Paul said, one, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, that, that one, one faith for all people, that universal faith, that Catholic faith. So now you kind of, kind of appreciate what the word means. Uh, so, so they're making, so as we'll, as we'll say, uh, St. Ignatius uses the term, he's one of the oldest ones who uses the term, to make this distinction of that universal doctrine that was shared by all, you know, those communities, you know, Corinth, Ephesus, uh, Rome, Antioch, Jerusalem, that universal faith that the apostles distributed, and then those who are, you know, like I made allusion to last week, those Gnostics who taught all kinds of kooky things, you know, they... You know, some didn't believe that Jesus had a real body. They thought he was a, it was a vision. You know, some didn't believe that he was, you know, God at all. 
but you know they still proclaim themselves to be Christians, and so that's where then it became necessary to to really distinctify the Church of the Apostles between these little churches or these other little communities that also claim to be Christian, but you know what they call the heretics. <clears throat> Matthew 28. And the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you. So there's a really another important fact that we'll get into in a minute here when we talk about the authority of the church. And so, and it, of course, and it's all, again, connected you know, that, those concepts of the church as the body of Christ. Christ is with, he says, I am, will be with you. Uh, to the very end of the age, you know, church, Christ is always with His church. Christ is always inside His church, and that's how we can appreciate that the church has its authority to teach. You know, especially when we appreciate that the church is, you know, guided by the Holy Spirit, animated by the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ being animated by the Holy Spirit throughout the ages. You know, so the church has always had this, you know, appreciation as the, this Holy Mother Church, the, the teaching, you know, office of the church. <clears throat> So, so where specifically did the title Catholic come from? The oldest recorded usage of this adjective to describe the church as the Catholic Church or Universal Church comes from Ignatius of Antioch, who was a disciple of the Apostle John and who the, the Apostles had made bishops of one of those apostolic sees that I had mentioned to you before, uh, Antioch. So, you gotta, so he was given a very great dignity to be one of the bishops of one of these head churches, you know, made, by, made an apostle, by, or made a bishop by... You know, St. John and the Apostle Peter, you know. It's just amazing just to kind of reflect on who these people were and, you know, the great historical dignity that they had just being connected even to the Apostles. Okay, Ignatius said in one of his letters, this is, of course, in context. Now, you know, back then, you know, in the early church, you know, many times, you know, Christians were martyred for their faith. So uh, in the context of this letter, uh, St. Ignatius is being hauled off to Rome to be martyred. He's thrown to the lion's. And in one of his letters, he says, don't, don't stop this from happening. You know, it's likely God's will because, you know, I've, you know, uh, lived up to the faith and now I'm being given that great, you know, as Jesus says in the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount, that, you know, if they, they will persecute you and kill you for my, for, for my name's sake, but you are blessed. So he's, he's ready. You know, he's an old man, too. He's ready to receive his reward. So he's like, just let it happen if it's going to happen. You know, don't try to, you know. Intervene, you know, don't cause another, you know, a, a Christian war in, in, by any means. So that's the context of the letter. So he's he write, he's, he wrote these seven letters to these seven communities on his way to Rome. One of which was the church in Smyrna. He says, "Let and so that now this is he's referring part part to his you know his brother bishops. Let no man do anything connected with the, to the church without the bishop, and let that be deemed a proper Eucharist." which is administered by either the bishop or the one he has entrusted with, with it, which would be, you know, the priest as today, you know. The, the bishops are very often so spread thin because they have a lot to, a lot of, you know, a lot of ground to cover with all their parishes. So, you know, of course, that's the, where the, uh, the apostolate of the priesthood comes in, you know, that minister of the priesthood to be the bishop's kind of right-hand men. Or the bishop, <clears throat> but, the, but, the, but the bishop is still understood as the successor to the apostles, not the priest but the actual full bishop. A, a priest, of course, as Father will talk about in a future talk on the Sacrament of Holy Orders, a priest has a sharing in the bishop's authority. So the bishop being the, the ordinary means of authority. He says, wherever the bishop is, where the, wherever the bishop shall appear, there let the multitude of the people also be, even as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. He's where, you know, coming and speaking in that Pauline Mindset of you know the whole universal church, all the people united to Christ, wherever the bishop is, where you know wherever Jesus commissioned his apostles, we said a minute ago, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now at this time, when he's writing, all the apostles are dead, even though he was ordained. He's writing them, uh, one around 107, 110 A.D. The last apostle, the apostle John, died approximately in the mid 90s. So they've, they've all died off by now. He's an old man himself, you know, having been raised up by the teaching of the apostles and being an old man himself now 
he's speaking in that mindset, you know, of wherever Jesus Christ is, wherever the bishop is, you know, who has, you know, is passing on, you know, that that teaching to all nations. There's that unity now, another level of this unity between the bishop and Jesus Christ and the body of Christ. So he says, it is not lawful without the bishop either to baptize or to celebrate a love feast. Or that, or that uh, phrase again, which is, you know, re he's referring, it's one of the ancient terms for the Mass. But very soon it is also called the Mass, and we'll talk about it again in a later uh, talk. But wherever so the bishop shall, uh, whatsoever the bishop shall approve of, that is also pleasing to God, so that everything may be done and secure and valid. So he's making that point of authority that, you know, that, you know, it's not like the Gnostics who just kind of go out and teach their own thing, you know. There's that, that authority there within the body of Christ. So the name of the religion and the name of the church. So the, so the simple name of, you know, we're gathered in St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, but the simple name of, you know, the name under which we gather is Christian. You know, as Catholics, we, you know, are supposed to first and foremost acknowledge that we're Christians. So often, it, it just, it frustrates me so bad, especially, of course, being a Protestant, becoming Catholic, you know. So as a kid, you know, even though I said before that, you know, my father had a very strong Seventh-day Adventist influence on us, we preferred to call ourselves just Christian, you know. We didn't want to call ourselves Seventh-day Adventist, you know. We didn't want to call ourselves Lutheran, what have you. We just, you know, want to take the, the biblical name of Christian, of course, which, of course, is very good and right, just as we do as Catholics. So, but as I said, you know, in that kind of historical perspective, unfortunately, we've had to distinguish ourselves, you know. We had to distinguish ourselves from the Gnostics, we had to distinguish ourselves later from the Arians who taught something else about Jesus. And we had to distinguish ourselves later from the Monophysites, you know, one of those heresies. So the point being is that, unfortunately and sadly, you know, men very often in their own, however you want to, you know, describe it, their arrogance, their, you know, self-mind, high-mindedness of their own, you know, learning, they get these their own ideas and think, well, I'm going to teach this. And very often the church would say, no, that's wrong. And then very often people say, sorry, my bad. And they would, you know, come back in line with the church. Sometimes they didn't, unfortunately. So, so the, the, that adjective of Catholic had to be added to the church in order to kind of more fine-tune what the church is, you know, where you can find this, this universal, visible teaching. Sort of thing. So it's an added adjective to help us understand, you know, kind of pinpoint in on where the church is, you know, throughout the ages. So as I said last week, because we all believe that our salvation is accomplished through Jesus Christ, we're all, even whether we're Catholics or Protestants, we're still, we're all Christians, but there's that distinguishment, you know, as after the Protestant Reformation, as we know, you know, there's various Methodists, but, you know, I made that list of all, a bunch of the names, you know, there's various teachings in, so, but the church has always, you know, tried to, even though it's developed and grown, you know, kind of, you know, the implications of the faith, you know, when things are, when the ch faith is challenged, you know, it will the faith grows, so it's not like it's not like it's a change or a difference, but a you know a more fuller understanding of the faith throughout the centuries. <clears throat> and so the simple name of the church is just the church, but the Catholic was added on to it. Okay, here's another pet peeve of mine. Actually, it's a lot of Catholics do this. They call it, they refer to the, themselves as Roman Catholic. This is the article where I gave you, and this is something I picked up in my own. Uh, scholarly reading in college. <clears throat> the term Roman Catholic is actually an Anglican misnomer or kind of a misused name that they used in a, in a theological theory of theirs called the branch theory. Uh, the Anglicans, of course, are part of the Reformation when King Henry VIII broke away from the church. And then in the uh, 19th century, uh, there's what they referred to as uh, the Oxford movement and such. Uh, one of the theories that came out of that was what they referred to as the branch theory, trying to basically justify their division from the church. So in order to justify their division, you know, like I said, there's different apostolic sees, like there's Jerusalem, Antioch, Rome, Alexandria, but they're all of the Catholic Church. They're all still connected as one. But in order to uh, justify their own distinction or their own division, the Anglican, some Anglican theologians came up with this concept of the branch theory. So they, they, they hypothesized that there's the Anglican Church, 
the, uh, which is, you know, they, a lot of Anglicans, high, what they call high Anglicans, they'll refer to themselves as Anglo-Catholics. So they refer to themselves as English Catholics. And then you have the Roman, they, they, what they said is the Roman Catholics, and then the Eastern Catholics, you know, the Eastern Orthodox. So kind of trying to fit themselves into one of those, you know, these distinctions. But, you know, the, 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 the kind of the error behind that is there was distinction between those apostolic sees because just because they were just a different local community, but yet of the one same church, whereas the Anglicans are actually broken away; they're in schism from the one church. So, so you have, you know, Antioch, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Rome, but they're they all they're all you know under the authority. You know, they all look to the Pope as or the Bishop of Rome as that final authority. Whereas the Anglicans, they can't say that. You know, they don't look to the Pope. You know, they look to their own. The Bishop of Canterbury. <clears throat> Justin, one of the things that goes along with today too is the American Catholic Church, which they kind of set up their own rules and regulations. And again, not everything goes along with the Pope. And right. So, uh, in the Roman, if you're a Roman Catholic, you follow yourself right from the beginning all the way through. I mean, it's a straight line. Right. So, but what is, what, what is more of the valid, so, yeah, uh, so, what the, what, Danny's were alluding to probably is what the more valid understanding of what they're really referring to is as as Catholics in well you know like our form of worship and looking to the, the Bishop of Rome as our final authority we are uh, Ro uh, Roman right you know that's our our form of worship so like I said before you know you have the the Coptic Church down in Alexandria there the Coptic Catholic Church you know they have their own distinctive right but they are part of the Catholic Church. You know, they're not part of the Roman Rite, but they still you know, look to the Bishop of Rome as that final authority. So it's, it's, it's wrong to ba basically label ourselves as Roman Catholics because there are other people of our, of our church, but they're not of the Roman Rite. So. And also the article, he says, uh, Vatican II very intentionally uh, left out referring to themselves as Roman Catholics because being that part of that misnomer, the, the church will refer to you know, the, the Latin rite or the Roman rite of the mass you know, being distinct. But, but the, the church, when referring to the church itself, very intentionally just referred to the church as the Catholic church, so as to recognize and embrace and encompass all those other brother and sister Christians of like the different rites, you know, the, the oriental rite, you know, even in the far east, they're still part of the Catholic church. So another side note, and so this is another one. If anybody ever asks you, you know, friend or family or you know, acquaintance, uh, you know, start talking about your Christian faith, what denomination do you belong to? Don't fall into the trap. I, what I do is I say, oh, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't belong to a denomination. I'm Catholic. I belong to the original church. And so then very, very often, I mean, if you want to get into a discussion or debate, you know, maybe you want to do this, maybe you don't. <laughs> so <laughs> it might open up a can of worms. But of course, you know, getting back into this historical mindset of the church and all these little breaks, the word denomination denotes a break. You know, it's it's a part of a whole. So of course, when if when we appreciate historically the Catholic Church going all the way back to the beginning and being the full church with all those different you know various rites, like I said a minute ago, but yet being all still united in, as that one body, you know, it's still that one whole, even though many parts, as Saint Paul said.